welcome. I thank you for joining us here in the historic sanctuary of St. John's United Church in downtown Moncton on this, the second Sunday in the season of Lent. This is a holy time in which we invite people to go deeper in faith, whether it's through prayer, the reading of scripture, the singing of songs, acts of service to the world, or self-examination of who we are as followers of Jesus. One of the blessings of being a part of a congregation like this is that we don't make demands of people's faith, but we do have expectations that we will be the hands and feet of God serving the world around us in response to what we do believe about the one who came and showed us that the kingdom of God is closer to us than we could possibly imagine. Perhaps you have sensed that holiness in your life through the love you have experienced, the tears you have cried, the laughter you have known, or in those quiet, still moments. I want to remind everyone of our Zoom Bible study, which will begin this Wednesday at 7 p.m., and will continue on Wednesday evenings for the month of March. We set that time for people who want to take part yet have to work during the day. So don't worry about getting the dishes done. Just put them aside and come and sit with the scriptures for a while and the conversation. If you do want to take part, send us an email or let us know and we'll get the proper information to you. Also, we are inviting people who have been part of St. John's, whether with us in person or online with us during this global pandemic, to consider becoming a more formal part of the church by becoming a member. If you'd like to know more about that, please contact me or send an email or a phone call and we'll, we'll be in touch with you. Whether you're a teenager or whether you're somebody who has uh, just been on the, on the outskirts of the congregation for a while but would like to become more active, we'd love to talk to you about that. Also, the province has announced that it is likely we'll be back in the yellow phase of recovery in um, by the end of next week. So if that's the case, we anticipate returning to in-person worship on March the 14th, and we'll send out information on how you can register to attend services at that time. So keep an eye out for that announcement, which will be on the front of our website, on our Facebook page, and we'll highlight that in our pastoral letters. Thanks again for being here with us. Let us worship God. Please join with me in our call to worship. Do not be afraid. It was what we come together to worship and praise to remember. We do not need to fear. It is the encouragement we are given through angels and visions. Do not be afraid. Here we come to tell the truth. We have been afraid. We feared so much in this past year for ourselves, for people of color, immigrants and refugees, for the common good and the goodness of people. We have been in awe of how terrible things could get and felt like we couldn't do anything to change the arrogance and hate that overpowered our hope. Today we come to hope. We come to put that horror behind us and lean into the possibility of what will be in the days ahead we come to worship the one who makes all things new and assures us again and again not to be afraid. I invite you to pray with me now. O oh God, we need to feel your presence behind us as much as we need to know you are leading us forward. We need you behind us to encourage us and push us forward. For if you are not there, we will drag our feet and refuse to move. We have wondered so much this year about what our lives are worth. Masks have covered our nose and mouth because we believe that others have worth. But if we are honest, O oh God, we haven't found our own worth. We have been scared by unknown particles and airborne germs and we have felt so human. We have been so aware of our humanity and all of its limitations, so that we haven't really allowed ourselves to see beyond this moment. 
We are just trying to get through this disaster so that we can think of blessings and other such divine things. We are wrong, O God. We need to feel your push, square in the center of our backs, to dream and wonder and believe that there will be more than this. Get behind us and push us toward the fruitfulness of tomorrow. We pray in your hope. Amen. Our hymn today is from Voices United. It's called Jesus Christ is Waiting. This is a version from the Iona community in Scotland. And I first heard the person who wrote it um, at a preaching festival down in Nashville. And it was really energizing for him to, to lead the group and to share with us the stories of the songs that he'd written with the Iona community. And so we sing this today, and it's one that we've done over the years, but isn't as familiar as some of the, as some of the Lenten hymns. So please uh, sing along with it. Our first scripture reading today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. After you, for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants, after you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd now like to welcome Sophie Bulmer, who will be reading our gospel passage for today. Mark eight thirty one through 37. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, 
and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The Way of the Cross Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever wondered how you will die? I don't ask that to be morbid, but it is a question that we don't often think about in a world that teaches us only to live, only to be more young, only to deny death in a lot of ways by not talking about it. And yet, as we have seen over this past year, it is a topic that cannot be avoided. Like many of you, I was shocked to hear about Tiger Woods' accident and the subsequent news frenzy as people tried to figure out what happened and how he had been injured and the reports that said that he nearly died in that car accident. Say what you will about Tiger, but people love that guy. Years ago, I used to visit with a couple who were quite the pair and they had retired by the time that I knew them. They had eventually moved to Halifax, but while they were here in Moncton, they loved St. John's and I'd go to see them. One funny story I told years ago after it happened involved them. The husband had taken a heart attack while in hospital and died. And through a miracle, according to the medical people, he was resuscitated and brought back to life. So they called me from the hospital to say that this had happened and I talked to his wife and I went up from the church and I, I walked in the room and, and there he was. And I said, hello. And he said, hi, and had that little bit of a back and forth about what had just happened. And I said, where's your wife? And he said, oh, she's down the hall watching Tiger. <laughs> you know, it's true love when you're brought back from the dead and you don't mind it when your wife goes back to finish watching Tiger Woods play golf. <laughs> <clears throat> In this passage from Mark's Gospel, Jesus predicts his death for the first time. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering, Jesus tells the disciples quite plainly. He must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Debbie Thomas writes, Standing on this side of resurrection history, we too easily miss the bombshell effect of these words and how the, the effect they must have had on Jesus' disciples. Their great hope, cultivated over the three years that they had followed Jesus, was that he would lead them in a military revolution and overthrow their Roman oppressors. After all, they had seen his miracles, they had witnessed firsthand his charismatic ability to draw huge crowds, they had heard him proclaim loud and clear the arrival of a new kingdom. He was their longed-for future, their cherished dream. So what could be more disorienting, disorienting, more ludicrous than the news that their would-be champion was so determined to walk straight into a death trap? It says in scripture that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew what was coming. To surrender without a fight to a common criminal's death. In an exchange with Peter, Jesus accuses him of putting his mind not on divine things, but on human things. And that's not a sentiment that you read in a Hallmark card, is it? It's hard to imagine what went through Peter's mind when Jesus called him Satan, because from Peter's point of view, he doesn't want to see these things happen to Jesus. It's a very human response, I think. 
to what Jesus had said where he expects to die. That Peter doesn't want that. And Jesus expects divine living from such hard words. When Peter acknowledges only the human side of things, Jesus rebukes him. Yet later, when Peter recognizes the divinity within Jesus, Jesus calls him the rock. Jesus has clear instructions for his followers when he says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the gospel, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. It's a powerful statement upon which churches have been built, souls have been saved, hospitals and schools have been built, as people following in the way of Jesus have learned to put others before themselves. They've denied themselves in service to the world around them. Years ago, we had a retired teacher in this congregation by the name of Sybil Fowler give a children's time. And the kids were listening as she taught them this word, what the word joy meant. Jesus, others, you. And the kids kind of left that, that session and a few weeks later a mother in the congregation con contacted me and she said she had a call from the principal to say that her son wasn't doing his own work because he was helping the kids around him. And when the teacher asked him why he wouldn't do his own work, he said, joy, Jesus, others, you. <laughs> hard to argue against that logic. When you follow Jesus, life gets a little more complicated. Sometimes when we think about this idea though that you have to deny yourself, it's one of those things that makes us take a pause and wonder what does that exactly mean? And it's something that we often would associate with Lent. So many use self-denial as an excuse to diet by cutting out the foods that are unhealthy as a way of giving up something for Lent which was always the Roman Catholic tradition. By the time I came to understand what Lent was, it was always with, within the concept of not giving something up, but taking something on. And that always made sense to me. I once saw a picture in a magazine with a quote by uh, Roger Houston that said, when you die, God and the angels will hold you accountable for all the pleasures you were allowed in life that you denied yourself. Of course, all things in moderation, but the point is made, to what extent does Jesus expect us to deny ourselves the rich experiences of life? To what extent does Jesus intend for us to pursue suffering and death? A holy life has to be about more than just dying. And a holy life sometimes, I think, is something that Jesus intends for us, but at what, what, at what extreme do we take ourselves sometimes? Sometimes I meet people who are hyper-focused on the afterlife and on religion and rules that they aren't able to experience any joy. Sometimes I meet people who are so hyper-focused on the afterlife as the expression goes that they're so heavenly focused they're no earthly good. And I don't think Jesus commands us to deny ourselves to the point that the world is some kind of holy mission field and we have to convert each one to the kingdom. I can't recognize that in the Jesus who played with children, the Jesus who turned water into wine, the Jesus who advocated for the widow and for the orphan, for the prisoner, for the outcast. So what does it mean to deny ourselves? How shall I save my life by losing it for Jesus' sake? in the 21st century as a citizen of Canada. How shall I die? We live in the world where in the United States alone, as we've heard the number, 500,000 people have died in the past year due to a virus that we were, we were barely aware of before it hit. Nearly 22,000 people in Canada have died. Two and a half million people across the world. And the question is becoming, how do we mentally, physically, and spiritually absorb those numbers. How is it, like the po poet Malcolm Geith said, you know, behind each face, one beloved name, one beloved person. How do we as a church find a role in helping people through this pandemic? I think there's opportunities for all of us to come alive with our faith during this time and each of us find ways to do that. And 
where we lean towards the answer to the question, how shall I die? To take up the cross of Jesus is to stand in the center of pain. To look out from the cross and to see the people who have been affected by the power of death, the people who suffer, it asks more of us to offer more than just our thoughts and prayers, but to commit ourselves to a work of service, of justice, of feeding people, of being the hands and feet of Jesus in the places in which we find ourselves. Places where that little boy found himself with his classmates from years ago, from the point of view of people who are in our hospitals doing the best they can during these strange times. And it's hard to answer that question of how shall I die when our movements and social circles are so restricted. You know, how do you serve a planet? How do you serve the people around us when we can't even be around them? When I was at the hospital the other evening, um, I was put on someone's list of 10 for palliative care to go in and visit them. And as I stood in line, I, I saw that the woman ahead of me started yelling at one of the screeners at the entrance of the hospital. And I was shocked and I know that they were doing their best, but her name wasn't on a sheet to let her in to see a patient. And I admired the staff because they were so calm. They were the model of a non-anxious presence. And I'm sure this was just one of many situations like this that they've encountered. And here they were serving the community by keeping us safe, and yet um, they had to experience that hostile situation. So we continue to hold it in our prayers, the people who are in hospital and isolated and those who are working in the hospital as they do their work to help people heal. When I went to pray with my friend, once I finally got in, I went into her room and it was in the evening and the room was dark and um, she wasn't awake. And I, I didn't touch her hand, but I kind of said her name a couple of times and tried to Normally you just tap someone's hand, but now that we can't do that, um, but she didn't rouse. So I just sat beside her bed and I said the Lord's Prayer out loud and I read Psalm 23 from my phone in that room and I thanked her for her friendship over the years and commended her soul to God. Her husband said to me the next morning she rallied a bit and started to hum a hymn. And the faith that sustained her in life is also the faith that's sustaining her in her dying as she continues to lay unable to communicate, but humming along with the hymns on the stereo in her room. How shall I die? How shall I die? Accepting against everything the world tells me that I will die. And trusting in Jesus' assurance that I will rise again, how shall I live my life? Shall I live with numbness and apathy at the pain and the suffering around the world? That's a world that seems to punish people with poverty. And the abundant life, or should I choose to experience the abundant life Jesus offers to those who ache? The life that Jesus offers to those who weep and bleed alongside the world's suffering. That's the question I'm asking today in Lent. How shall I die? Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to thank you for being with us today in this way. I look forward to when we can gather again in person and to be able to share in the peace of Christ, even if it is over a mask with our eyes. But at the same time, uh, any way we can be together is meaningful to me, and I'm very grateful for all of this, and I'm, I'm grateful that you're staying with us and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in a world that desperately needs to hear it. May God bless all of you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen.